Hi, I'm Seth Samuel. I'm here to talk to you about WebGL for more than graphics, which is a lot easier to say than the old title of this talk, so that's nice. Uh, I am from New York City. I've lived in New York, Portland, various other places, Portland, New York again. I can never move again because it would destroy the symmetry of where I've lived, and that would be terrible. Uh, I'm Seth F. Samuel on Twitter, and I'm Seth Samuel on GitHub, where you can find these slides, including all the links and demo code and all of that if you're curious. All right, quick disclaimer before we start. This talk is pretty deep in the weeds. I also talk pretty fast and use a lot of idioms like deep in the weeds. So if you get lost, it's totally my fault, not yours. Please come ask me questions afterwards. I love answering, or love talking about this stuff. I don't actually have a timer. I can just talk forever. Awesome. Uh, so first, what's WebGL? Well, WebGL is a JavaScript API that lets you run GPU code from within the browser. So it's based on OpenGL, which is the open graphics library, I think. Oh, there we go, timer, score. Uh, and what it lets you do is write JavaScript that runs in the browser, and then you can call out through WebGL to the operating system, which will then run your graphics code directly on the GPU, which will then paint a picture back onto an HTML5 canvas that's just like any other HTML canvas in the browser. And what this means is you can run GPU code, which is really, really fast. This is the closest you can get to the metal in the browser until WebAssembly becomes a thing someday. So the general shape of a WebGL program is this. You put in data. It passes through a vertex shader. Then it passes through a fragment shader, and then you get graphics. So what are shaders? Shaders are just programs. They're just little pieces or big pieces of code that take some input from earlier in the chain and pass off data to later in the chain. So the vertex shader takes your data and turns it into points in three-dimensional space. That's it. So your data could just be points in three-dimensional space, in which case the vertex shader is just the identity. It passes it right through. Or maybe you're going to give it some more raw data, like uh, a audio file that you want to make a visualizer for. So you give it the audio sound, and it figures out where the 3D space visualization of that audio is. And then the fragment shader colors in the fragments that are created by those vertices. So that, that one's name actually sort of makes sense. Uh, so it shades the fragments into different colors, and then uh, OpenGL or WebGL just flatten it down into a rasterized graphic, which gets shipped back to the browser. So what does it look like? So yeah, anybody can see that. Cool. This is just a simple gradient. So because WebGL is sort of C-like, the way you return a value is by setting a global variable. It's, it's very good programming practice. And so the, this is a fragment shader, which will draw a simple gradient. S and T are our coordinates along the, the two-dimensional plane that we're drawing on. And we're just going to set it equal to red to S, green to T. Blue is going to be 0, and alpha is always 1. It's just an RGBA tuple, just like you'd use in CSS. And you get this. So this is live. This is an actual iframe showing WebGL code. And you can see up at the top left, it's all black because S and T are 0. And where it's all red, it's in the top right, green. Simple, easy. And the cool thing here is all of those colors, you can see that gradient's really smooth. If you've ever worked with CSS gradients, you often get these banding, and you can have problems. And that gradient, good, it is smooth up on that big screen. That gradient is super smooth. And the reason is that WebGL is actually calculating every single pixel of that 1024 by 1024 image. And it's doing it really fast, because it's calculating the colors for every pixel at the same time. So we can use this for things like graphics analysis. So an edge finder is, if you have an image, oh, we had a talk earlier. Everybody knows what an edge finder is. Cool, I can do it really fast. An edge finder finds edges in images by looking at pixels and looking at either side and seeing how different those pixels are, and if they're very different, you found an edge. So here, we're just going to, for every single pixel, look at the distance between, the, the color distance between it and the pixel to the left. If it's bigger than some threshold that we're going to set, then we're going to draw it as pink, and then if not, we're going to draw it as black. All right. Here is a small child attempting to eat an entire block of cheese. <laughs> it's, it's a reasonable thing to do with a block of cheese. And you can see we found all the edges in the image. And with this little slider over here, I can change that threshold. So we can either look for every tiny little thing that looks like it might be an image, or uh, sorry, an edge, or we can be really strict and say we only want to find the, the strongest edges in the image. And we can do this in real time. So this is another 
1024 by 1024 image. Uh, if you try to do this in JavaScript, on smaller images, you can get away with it. But on bigger images, it's just going to choke the browser, because it has to go through every single pixel in the image and look left and right to see if it's very different. So if I can bring the threshold all the way down, we just find the really strong ones. I go up here, basically everything looks like an edge with a threshold of nearly 0. And that's cool, and it happens really fast. And particles, it's not a WebGL talk without a particles demo. They have nothing to do, well, they have a little bit to do with the talk, but mostly you need particles in a WebGL demo. So this here is a vertex shader, and we're going to set the GL position, which is like the frag colors, just where that data becomes a point in 3D space. And we're going to set it to sine of some math and cosine of some math. Uh, for those who object, sine and cosine are also math, but they're swirly math, which is where the swirliness of the particles come from. And there's one particle. Ooh. All right, let's add a few more. All right. There we go. There's some more particles. More particles. More particles. More. It's 100,000, 200,000, 300. All right, we got 300,000 particles there. And they're pre still pretty smooth. Uh, and because we can animate 300,000 particles at once at pretty close to 60 frames a second, because every single one of them is being worked on separately. All right, so why? Why can we do these things that we can't do in JavaScript? The main difference is because you have two main computing engines within your computer. You have a CPU and a GPU. Your CPU is your general purpose, despite the acronym, uh, processing unit, which is really good at doing lots of things pretty well. I mean, pretty well here meaning that the amount of power in this computer is more than the entire world you know, a decade or two ago. But still, it's good at lots of things. The GPU is good at a very small number of things, but it's really, really good at them. And what those things are is doing lots of little math operations at once. So uh, suppose you wanted to do thousands of kindergartners' math uh, homework at the same time. That's what a GPU is great for. You can do lots of little pieces of math, not very complex, but you can do them all at the same time. And it turns out that's how you do graphics. And so we've created these very specialized pieces of computing to be able to generate graphics and three-dimensional graphics very quickly. So someone came along and said, wait a second, there's things beyond graphics that it would be great to be able to use this parallel processing power for. And so what they did is WebGL is based on OpenGL. And so they created OpenCL, which is the open computing library. And what it does is sort of take away the more graphics-y parts of the library unless you access that raw processing power without having to pretend you're doing graphics. And it's great. And you can do all sorts of cool things with it. So if OpenGL is made available to us as web developers by WebGL, what about OpenCL? Well, there's WebCL. It's coming soon. It's, it's never coming. Uh, it's, been, it's been in committee for a very long time. It's pretty out of date at this point and probably will never arrive in the browsers. There's compute shaders, which are like vertex shaders and fragment shaders, which now make no sense because I'm not sure what we're shading in with the compute here. But they're also coming soon. They might actually show up, but at this point, even OpenGL is kind of a little outdated. People have moved on to other uh, graphics architectures, so we might just get Open Vulc or Web Vulkan or something like that before we get compute shaders. Um, so what if we just did it ourselves, right? We're developers. We're good at coding things, ish. And so what do we do? We can pass data in. We can do all the math. So how do we get the data out of WebGL? If you remember that little flowchart earlier, all we get back is graphics onto an HTML canvas. We don't get to call out to the, the graphics card directly and say, hey, can you tell me what the raw result of these calculations were? Pixels. Uh, all we got is pixels, so we're going to use pixels. And if you think about it, a pixel's just a 32-bit int, right? It's an RGBA tuple, which is 255, 255, it's 0, 255, so that's 8 bits, 8 bits, 8 bits, 8 bits. That's 32 bits. That, that's a big number. You can get a decent amount of data out with that. And we have canvas.get image data. So we can actually just ask the HTML canvas, hey, give me every pixel that is in you right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to let the uh, graphics card do its thing, and we're going to return the data output of our calculation as pixels. No problem. There's a couple implementation challenges. Uh, the, this is the biggest one. So it turns out to be fairly expensive to send data to the graphics card and really expensive to do that get image data call. It's really slow in the terms of computing. And so what we need is something where we can ship a lot of data to the graphics card, have it do a lot of stuff, 
and then get it all back. Because if we're pinging back and forth constantly, we're going to lose all the benefits of the GPU. Matrix multiplication. This is cool. Matrix multiplication is lots of math. It's really simple. And we can bundle it all up into a giant calculation that we pass to the graphics card and get back. So it has small matrix multiplications, 2 by 2s, 3 by 3s, 4 by 4s, all milt in. But if you want to do bigger matrices, we're going to have to do a little bit of magic. All right, so a quick brush up on matrix multiplication. Those who have not done it since school, those who did not pay attention in school, like <laughs> some of us, uh, and those who've never done it all, don't worry, it's really simple. So uh, the cursor showing up, cool. Uh, so this top left cell, so we're going to multiply, just like you multiply two numbers, you can multiply two matrix, matrices. And a matrix is nothing more than a table of numbers. So if we're going to multiply these two up here, then the way we do that is for this top left cell here, we take the first row of the left one and the first column of the right one. We sort of do a little twink, and then we multiply each of the cells and add them together. So 5 times 9 plus 6 times 7 is 87. I got a really hard one this time. Let's, there we go. That's easier math. So 5 times 0 plus 6 times 9 is 54. And you can see that there's sort of a geometry to it here, where moving across different cells moves you through different rows and columns in the, in the, the origins. So this is the 2 by 2 case. And you just extend this out to 3, 4, 5, a million. So speaking of a million, all right. So on the, in the WebGL code, we're just going to do this, which is just a loop. So for every single pixel, which we're now going to think of as a matrix cell in our output, we're going to iterate through the correct row and column of the inputs, add them together, or multiply them, add them to the total sum, and then set the color equal to that sum. All right, so demo time. Yay. All right, this is a 3 by 3 example. So we can do this on the CPU. It's pretty fast. It's only doing uh, a lot, not too much math. Uh, let's do it on the GPU. So it's actually slower. And that's because of that serialization. The cost of actually taking this small amount of data, shipping it to the GPU, getting it back, is more expensive than what we're saving by doing it in parallel. So let's bump this up a little. All right. So it's closer. The numbers are still the same. That's good. It wouldn't be very good if, if we did it fast but wrong. Well, some applications. All right, cool. So about six. So these are actually 64 by 64, but I don't have that big a screen. Uh, so you can see we've got lots of numbers. And now the GPU is starting to pull ahead. There's a little noise in the benchmarks here. Uh, let's just turn it all the way up to 11. OK. So we got a little bit of time now. This is the part of the talk where I get to talk about whatever I want, because my slides are stuck, and you can't stop me. Uh, so first thing you'll notice is there's a spinner there. And that's kind of cool, because I'm not going to open up the activity monitor for fear of breaking this and having to start from scratch. But we're using 100% of the CPU right now. This is running in JavaScript. It is iterating across a million elements, doing lots and lots and lots of math. And the, the browser's locked up. If I tried to click on another button or move that slider at the top, it, it just won't happen. But the spinner is merrily spinning along. And that's because it's using CSS animation on the GPU. <laughs> yeah. You can actually use the GPU for graphics if you want to be boring. Uh, so it's just a little, you know, it's like a little div with a width and a height and a CSS transform. So the interesting thing here is that if I started that spinner instantly, it won't actually animate. Because, so the way it starts is there's a CSS class that gets added that turns on the appropriate CSS attributes to show it and to also do the spin. And that CSS class change requires a DOM recalc and a draw and a paint and all those things. And all those things happen on the CPU. So if I try and start the spinner the very second I, or the very instant I hit go CPU, it won't actually spin because it won't have time to ship off, to do that DOM calc, ship it off to the GPU to then be animated on the GPU. So there's a little delay in here. And if you were paying really close attention earlier, you might have noticed that the spinner on like the 3x3 three three case, which only, the, the CPU only took two milliseconds, but the spinner showed for about 100 to 300 milliseconds. I forget what the timeout is right now. Uh, and the reason there is because I just left it in all the time. But that's actually good UX, because your user, if they just see a little flash of a spinner, they're like, what just happened? So even if your spinner is slower than your event, it can be nice to let them sort of process the fact that there's a spinner there. It's just nice. So I haven't gotten the pop of a doom yet. Uh, 
it's, it's actually kind of terrifying how random it is during this demo, whether it gives you the, this script is taking abnormally long, would you like to kill it, pop-up. Uh, just sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. When it doesn't, I get really scared that it's not actually working. Uh, we'll find out in a little while. And one thing I found out about that spin, the, the little pop-up of Doom, is it doesn't actually pause or cancel JavaScript execution at all. Uh, while that pop-up comes up, the execution is still running. So you can't really rely on that as a way to sort of save you from really horrible websites that are just killing you on the CPU. You have to hit the kill button. Or if you're working on a demo like this, you don't have to hit the kill button. You can just let it run in the background, uh, which is nice. I will admit to a tiny bit of cheating here. Uh, the, the CPU demo, ooh, there we go. I won't have to admit to the cheating, yes. All right, so that's, uh, one, what did it run in this time? Oh, this computer's a lot faster than my old air. Cool, that's why I didn't get to tell the third story. All right, it's 170,000 milliseconds. So yeah, when you start having to put commas in your benchmarks to be able to read the numbers, or decimals, we're in, we're in Europe, whichever you use to make that number readable, uh, it's a bad sign about your benchmark. You probably should no longer be benchmarking, you should be rethinking what you're doing. Uh, all right, so that's 170,000 milliseconds, that's 170 seconds, that's just under three minutes. All right, GPU. All right, that's faster. Uh, so yeah, that, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's woe faster. So, so that's awesome. That's, that's really, really fast if you want to multiply two matrices together in the browser. So why? Because we can do all that math at once. Because rather than in the CPU case where we have to iterate through every cell and every column and every row, we can do every single cell at once. And what that boils down to, big O notation, not great for whiteboard interviews, very useful for telling why this is so much faster. So big O notation basically means about how fast does this take, or about how does this grow with input size. So the CPU version is n cubed, which basically means we have to, so if n is the width of this square matrix, we have to go through n times n for every single cell, and for each of those, we have to go through n inputs. Time's a constant, it's fine. Uh, for the GPU version, we just have to go through n, which is really, really good, because we're doing every single one of the outputs at once. The edge finder that we saw is n squared in CPU, and just n again in uh, the, the GPU, uh, which is why it's a lot more responsive too. So, you know, these are sort of mathy things. What does this look like when we graph it? So here from zero to five, so, you know, we're, we're basically at that first initial input. You can see n is that bottom line, n squared is the middle one, and n cubed <laughs> is the one that's shooting off towards the ceiling. Uh, and we're at zero to five here, and we just did 1024. So that kind of shows you where things are going. Here's zero to 10, 100. So at 100, 100 by 100, n has disappeared completely, n squared looks a lot like n did before, and n cubed is just, just still growing. And so there's our 1024 case. You can't even see how, uh, you can't even see the n and the squared compared to just how big n cubed gets. And that's why as this, that matrix size grows, we get so much benefit from running it in parallel and keeping to the n case rather than the n cubed. All right, cool. So we got a proof of concept. Uh, it works really well. What can we actually do with this if we want to be practical? Uh, all right, potential application. So hash collision. Uh, if you are a white hat hacker, you want to make sure that your password uh, database is secure. If you're a black hat hacker, you want to see if someone else's database is not secure. Bitcoin mining. All Bitcoin mining that's for real happens on GPUs. It's, it's just hashing and it's done on GPUs. Media encoding, if you want to make encode video, encode images, do anything like this, it's all, it's very parallelizable because it's all done in blocks. Uh, machine learning, like we saw earlier, is basically just a bunch of addition and multiplication happening all at once, which this is great for. Signal analysis and processing. Uh, signal analysis is basically just graphics but with sound, but it counts as something separate because we have a different name for it. Protein folding. If some of these are sounding familiar, if you ran a lot of screensavers back in the day, it's because the exact same properties we're looking for here of large amounts of data doing lots of work with an easily expressible result is exactly what you want if you want to have a screensaver that you send out to people to do work for you. Actual applications. Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. Yes, there are a couple libraries where you can do machine learning using your GPU in the browser right now. Uh, Keras is one of them, and there's a couple others, and it's cool, it's fast. 
Signals, maybe. I haven't seen it out library, but it should just work. And protein folding is outside my domain, but uh, if anybody here is an excellent biochemist and wants to put together a library, please do. All right, so why is it that we can't actually do those earlier things? That's not my cat, but my cat would totally get into that situation, says she's a little derpy. All right, here's the big one. There's no bit operations in the WebGL spec. So bit operations, things like bit shifts and bit shifts the other way, and XORs and all these things. Basically, all modern algorithms are built around bit operators because for the last 50 or 60 years, very smart people have thought, well, we're running computers, they work with bits. Why don't we build algorithms that work really well with bits? And it's true, it's a great idea. Except the version of WebGL that came out a few years ago was based on an older version of GLSL, which is what the, the language that runs on the GPU is called, and it didn't have bit operations, and they've never bothered to actually update WebGL to use them. And it's really hard to do a lot of these cool applications without bit operations. So, so basically anything hashy, so uh, Bitcoin mining, uh, password, or just general like hashes, uh, anything like that is all uh, media encoding is all based on bit operations, and you just can't do it right now. Uh, unresponsive window, if you, if you look, the, the spinner actually chunked really hard because it turns out animating on the, the GPU when you're also using the GPU for a bunch of math doesn't work so well. You only get so much GPU per application given to you by the OS. And so if you're doing this, your window, like if you thought doing a lot of stuff on the CPU made your window <laughs> unresponsive, make it so that you can't actually draw graphics to the computer anymore and see how much work you can actually get done. Uh, so this, this is a major problem if you want to run long running tasks. And OS level timeouts, this is a fun little gotcha. It turns out different OS drivers have different uh, just hard-coded timeouts when they'll just stop running shaders. They'll be like, no, that shader's run too long. I'm afraid you're hijacking my graphics card. And I'm just going to return something. Uh, it might be black, might be the last value to sit there, might be something. And so this is a major problem for long-running things. Uh, so what can we do to make it work for these other applications? Newer GLSL version would be awesome. 1.3 has uh, bit operations, which means that we could do all that cool hashing stuff. Uh, we might get that, probably not. We'll probably get Web Vulkan first. Uh, Canvas WebGL and Worker, this is, I believe, in Firefox out of even a flag now. If not, it's coming very, very soon. So this is going to be cool. If you're doing service workers and web workers, you can actually do GPU work in them, and that will help uh, avoid some of that window lockup problem. You can actually try it out right now. Is the author of TurboJS in the audience? No, damn. So uh, someone put together this very cool library a few weeks ago, which wraps up everything I just did in all those demos in a nice little package uh, and didn't take attribution for it. And I was hoping I'd get really lucky and they'd be here right now, but they're not. Uh, go try it out. You, it gives you a nice, simple JavaScript interface where you can write your shader code and give it the data as an array, and it'll give you back the return as an array and save you all the boilerplate, which you can see. If you're curious about what that boilerplate is, either go check out TurboJS or check out these slides. You'll be able to see how it works. You Basically, take your data, you turn it into an image because, and then you do some math on it, and then you get an image out. All right, so sum up, WebG uh, WebGL is awesome. Graphics are awesome. We can do WebGL for more than graphics, and you can actually do some real applications with this in your browser right now if you're doing stuff that takes a lot, a lot of processing power, and it's parallelizable, which some stuff is. Thank you. I know you got some, don't you got some?